The Kennedy Center presents Up Close and Personal, a tribute to Frank Lesser. Good evening and welcome to Up Close and Personal, Frank Lesser. Frank Lesser was born on June 29th, 1910. So clearly this year marks his centennial, which is really a perfect time to celebrate the legacy that he's left all of us. And what a legacy it is. He's left us dozens and dozens of songs that we all know, we all love, we all sing. And dozens and dozens of those songs have become part of what we call the Great American Songbook. And in addition to those songs, he's left us several great Broadway musicals that continue to be revived and revived, not just on Broadway, but nationwide, internationally, and in high schools and community theaters around the world. Uh, and like a lot of great musicals from the day of Frank Lesser, the evening would always begin with an overture. And tonight we actually had an overture created especially for you, and it was put together by our musical maestro for the evening. So please help me welcome the Tony Award winning conductor, arranger, and orchestrator, Mr. Don Pippin. God bless you. Thank you. The journey of Frank Lesser's career begins in New York in Tin Pan Alley, uh, where he has just a modicum of success. He eventually finds himself sent out to Hollywood where he becomes a very prolific and successful lyric writer. Uh, more often than not, he's paired with a great composer, but Frank really at heart would like to write his own music. And then later on, he comes back to New York and writes some of the great musicals that we all love. And there he writes both words and music. The year 1956, Frank Lesser writes book, music, and lyrics 
Was it an opera or was it a musical? I don't think it really matters because either way, it was a huge success. And there were many, many hit songs from that show, the show being The Most Happy Fellow. Uh, to sing one of the songs from that show is someone some of you may recognize if you were here for the Jerry Herman evening. Uh, those of you who watch television, he had a starring role in the long-running TV daytime drama, The Guiding Light. And theater audiences know him from his work in A Little Night Music, uh, Showboat, and Chicago. Please welcome Ron Raines. Like a perfumed woman The wind blows in the bunkhouse Like a perfumed woman Smelling of where she's been Smelling of Oregon cherries or maybe Texas avocado Or maybe Arizona sugar beet The wind blows in And she sings to me Cause I'm one of her rambling kids She sings a joy, 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 joy. You've been too long in one place. And it's time to go, time to go. I've been bunking in Gets to feeling too soft and cozy And when the grub they've been cooking me Gets to tasting too good When I've had all I want Of the ladies in the neighborhood She sees Lester's final Broadway triumph was in 1962, and what a triumph it was. It wins virtually every award the theater has to bestow. It runs and runs and runs, 
And it also gets a Pulitzer Prize, something rarely given to a Broadway musical. The show was called How to Succeed in Business Without Really Trying. Uh, it was revived just a few years ago with Matthew Broderick, and rumor has it it's about to be revived on Broadway next season as well. Uh, the show was a slice satire on the world of big business, uh, office politics, and certainly it reflected the sexual mores of the day. Those of you who watch Mad Men know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, to sing Happy to Keep His Dinner Warm from that show, we have the original star of Beauty and the Beast. She played Belle. Uh, she starred on Broadway as well in Thoroughly Modern Millie. And she was the best damn Sally Bowles I've ever seen on Broadway in Cabaret. Please welcome Susan Egan. Maybe White Plains. No. New Rochelle, New Rochelle. That's the place where the mansion will be for me and my darling bright young man. I've picked out for marrying me. He'll do well, I can tell. So it isn't a moment to sue. To plan on my life in New Rochelle, the wife of my darling tycoon. Honey, you'll be in New Rochelle. Your darling tycoon will be here in the office. The future Mrs. Finch is in for some lonely, lonely nights. Don, I am prepared for precisely that sort of thing. I'll be so happy to keep his dinner warm while he moves onward and upward. Happy to keep his dinner warm till he comes wearily home from downtown. I'll be there waiting until his mind is clear while he looks through me, right through me. Waiting to say good evening, dear. I'm pregnant. What's new with you from downtown? Oh, to be loved by a man I respect. To bask in the glow of his perfectly understandable neglect. Oh, to be long in the aura of his frown. Darling, busy frown. What heaven, wearing the wifely uniform as he goes onward and upward. Happy to keep his dinner warm till he comes wearily home from downtown. To help me paint a more detailed portrait of the great Frank Lesser, I'm honored and privileged to have as our special guest a woman who starred in The Most Happy Fellow. She virtually became a star overnight after her performance as Rosabella. She also eventually became Mrs. Frank Lesser. And to this day, she almost single-handedly keeps his legacy alive. She keeps it alive and she keeps it thriving. Please help me welcome Joe Sullivan Lesser. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, Frank's uh, growing up period. Uh, he was first generation German Jewish parents, and I understand that his father, brother, were all in the classical music world. What was that like for him? Well, I think uh, it, it um, let's say, drove him a little nutty. His father was a piano teacher, 
And so, of course, Frank would not take piano lessons. That settled that. He was not going to be in music at all. His brother was uh, quite a few years older than Frank, about maybe quite eight or nine years older than Frank, and was a superb concert pianist, Arthur Lesser. He wrote the definitive book on the piano called Men, Women, and Pianos. It's very, he was very respected. He was also the head of the Cleveland Institute of Music, and he accompanied a great singers. And I heard Arthur play many times, and let me tell you, he could really play. So Frank, of course, would not play the piano and would not study music, would not do any of those things growing up. Do you think they appreciated what he eventually did? Uh, uh, yes. I know, I know that his brother did, and I, I think his mother did, but she didn't want to tell him. She didn't want to encourage him too much. <laughs> uh, in doing some research this evening, I, I actually didn't talk to Joe about you know, Frank's career, and, and I did as much, as much research as I could. And I uh, found out that German was mainly the language in the house, yes. but Frank wouldn't speak German, is that correct? He wanted to be, quote, an American. He oh, wants no, he wasn't going to do anything they want him to do, no. <laughs> he would not speak German. <laughs> uh, I found the quote. T please tell me if this is correct. I, I, I found somewhere that Arthur, his brother, said, German was the vehicle of culture and loftier thought, but English was the medium suitable for purchasing vegetables. <laughs> Does that say... I'm not sure that Arthur... I never heard Arthur say that, but it sounds like he would have. <laughs> he had a great sense of humor. Uh, and, but Fra and Frank's father died when Frank was relatively young. He was 17 years old. So did Frank have to go out and help support the family? No, not at, he, he was, uh, you know, go, he went to college. He'd graduated from high school, and he went to college for one year, City College, but he quit. He told me he quit. I don't know if they threw him out, but he told me he quit. <laughs> <laughs> and he, uh, he wouldn't go into music. He didn't want to do any of that. He was a process server. I think he worked in a store for a lot of times. He, he worked for Women's Wear Daily, I yes, understand. Yes, he worked at Williams, Williams, the Women's Wear Daily. I got it out. <laughs> And uh, he, uh, he did everything but music. So when did he start to write lyrics? There must have come a point where he decided this is something I might want to try. Well, I think he tried uh, quite a few things. And he, there was so much music around the house, of course, and he heard it all the time. And I think that he decided he wanted to do that. And he had a very, very good friend. William Schumann, who became head of Juilliard. The William Schumann. The William Schumann, the fan. They were great friends, and they wrote their first song together. William wrote the music, and Frank wrote the lyrics. And uh, they went to, uh, it was the first published song Frank had, and, and so William too. It was called Love, In Love with the Memory of You. And they went to, uh, you know, on Broadway, they used to have those little booths where you went in and you sang a song and you could record it. And so they did that, and I still have the record. <laughs> they sang it pretty well, as a matter of fact. Another important composer that Frank would work on early in his career is a name that is probably forgotten today, Irving Ackman. Irving Ackman was one of Frank's great, great friends. The interesting thing that I found out, uh, he and Irving uh, contributed songs to a Broadway musical that didn't do well. In fact, it lasted less than two weeks. It was called The Illustrator Show. But Frank and Irving had a song called Bang the Bell Rang. Yes, I love that song, as a matter of fact. <laughs> I've, I've never heard it, so maybe tonight. All I did was look at you and bang the bell rang. <laughs> That's the way it goes. <laughs> well, well, be I love that song. It's early. And because of that song, one of the critics in The Hollywood Reporter commented on that particular song in this show that was not successful. And somebody out in Hollywood at one of the studios, Universal Studios, read that quote, and it was because of that that Frank was brought out to Hollywood. Is that not correct? Yes, that's true. He was brought out to work at two, with a studio, and he was signed up for a studio and worked and wrote the songs that they wanted him to write. The interesting thing about Frank's work in Hollywood, uh, and, and I think the, and the next five songs that we do tonight are, go are going to come from his Hollywood career. Uh, the, the question I wanted to ask you, did uh, Frank want to write words and music from the beginning, or do you think that he was okay about working with wh wh whatever composers they assigned him to out in Hollywood? Well, I think that he would never have said so 
but I think in the back of his mind, he always wanted to write words and music. But he uh, uh, only wrote, wrote music, um, words mostly, for you know, the 20 years he was in Hollywood. And he wrote with one of the, a lot of the great composers and learned a lot from watching them. Uh, among the many great composers, he worked with Burton Lane. Yes. He wrote uh, I Hear Music with Burton Lane. Uh, he, he wrote Heart and Soul. Nobody wrote, knows he wrote the lyrics to Heart and Soul with Ogie Carmichael. <laughs> and they wrote Two Sleepy People. Yes, and he, uh, yes. Yeah, and he, wrote, he also wrote with the great Friedrich Hollander, Let's See What the Boys in the Back Room Will Want. That's right. So I would assume that working with these various composers must have somehow influenced his writing later on when he returns to New York to write his own music, would you say? Well, I think he was studying them all the time and seeing what they were doing and thinking, someday I'm going to do that. <laughs> I think he was thinking that. Well, the first song I, I want to have the audience hear tonight uh, has an interesting little background. It's from the 1948 film Neptune's Daughter, which starred Esther Williams. But in the movie, only Frank's music was hit. This is one of the rare instances where Hollywood let him write the music and the words. But in the film Neptune's Daughter, you can only hear the music because MGM thought that the lyrics were a, a little too racy, uh, believe it or not. Uh, many of you have seen him on Broadway in such musicals as uh, Curtains and uh, Never Gonna Dance. And he's also had a wonderful career as a choreographer, most recently choreographing uh, Annie Get Your Gun up at Goodspeed. Please welcome Noah Racy. I guess the studio was worried about what it was clear what he would do to her on that slow boat to China. <laughs> uh, you know, it's interesting. World War II was such a fertile period for great songwriters, and Frank had a lot of hits during that era. 
what is it about World War II and Frank, do you think? That, that I don't know. I, I always said that he won the world, the war uh, single-handedly because he wrote so many hits. He wrote Praise the Lord and Pass the Ammunition. He wrote uh, Road to Victory. He wrote First Class Mary Brown. And uh, he wrote, he, he wrote a, so many, we, I don't know, it was just about seven or eight big kid songs. He was a private in the army. Well, one of the... Uh, it never went above that, by the way. He always <laughs> said, stayed private Frank Lesser. <laughs> well, one of the songs that Frank wrote about World War II is one of my favorites, particularly because there have been so many love songs about uh, longing and loss during World War II. But Frank was the only one who got the idea to write a song about... Uh, all the women that were left home and the pickings of men were very scarce at home because everyone was in the army. Uh, the song I'm thinking about uh, came from a movie called Thank You, Lucky Stars, 1943. Believe it or not, the song was introduced by Betty Davis. The music is by the great Arthur Schwartz. We have a real singer to sing that song. Please welcome back Susan Egan. <laughs> away and left this town as empty as can be. I can't sit under the apple tree with anyone else but me. For there is no secret lover that the draft board didn't discover. They're either too young or too old. They're either too gray or too grassy green. The pickings are poor and the crop is lean. What's good is in the army. What's left will never harm me. They're either too old or too young. So darling, you'll never be stung. Tomorrow I'll go hiking with an Eagle Scout unless I get a call from Grandpa for a snappy game of chess. I'm finding it easy to stay good as gold. They're either too young or too old. They're either too warm or too cold. They're either too fast or too fast asleep. So darling, believe me, I'm yours to keep. There isn't any gravy. The gravy's in the Navy. They're either too fresh or too stale. There is no available mail. I will confess to one romance I'm sure you would allow. He likes to serenade me, but his voice is changing now. I'm finding it easy to keep things controlled. They're either too young or too old. They're either too bald or too bold. I'm down to the wheelchair and bassinet. My heart just refuses to get upset. I simply can't compel it to, with no Marines to tell it to. I'm either their first breath of spring, or else I'm their last little fling. I either get a fossil or an adolescent pup. I either have to hold them off or have to hold them up. The battle is on, but the fortress will hold. They're either too young or too old. I'll never ever fail you while you are in Australia or out in the Aleutians or off amongst the Russians or flying over Egypt. Your heart will never beat it. And when you get to India, I'll still be what I bid ya. I've looked the field over, and lo and behold, they're either too young or too old. You know, that's a perfect example to show off Frank's brilliance, because here's a song that's almost 70 years old. It was written for something very specific, a very specific time, and yet the laughs are still there. The, the song still sparkles. Still sparkles. That's what sets someone apart. That's right. Uh, 
we're going to s switch uh, now a little bit. Uh, uh, after the Hollywood period, Frank comes to Broadway, and as I mentioned earlier, 1948, he writes, Where's Charlie? And after that, he has a huge, huge hit, Guys and Dolls, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But then in 1952, he goes back to Hollywood. He gets a call from the great broad Hollywood producer, Sam Goldwyn, who has the idea to write a picture for Danny Kaye uh, about the life of Hans Christian Andersen. The film was a huge, huge success, and I'm sure most of you know the great songs from it, Inchworm, Ugly Duckling, Wonderful Copenhagen, No Two People. Don Pippen put together a lovely suite of music from that film. Before we leave Frank's Hollywood career, there's one more song, uh, and it has a very interesting history. It was also used in the film Neptune's Daughter, 1949. It won Frank an Academy Award. Uh, MGM allowed the lyric to be heard in the film. Uh, but the song was actually written in 1944. Can you talk a little bit about the song? It's called Baby, It's Cold Outside. <laughs> well, <laughs> um... I don't know. I, I don't know really a great deal about it. I know that they there was trouble with them singing it because they were worried that it was too suggestive in the film. But they did they did let them do it, and uh, uh, I think that uh, because it, well, originally the song I think was written kind of just Frank wrote it as a party song. Well, he used to do that a lot. He used to write a lot of songs for party songs because in those days people sang at parties and had a great time. And I think he wrote it for a party song and sang sang it at many many parties. And finally he said to himself, "Wait a minute, I ought to make a buck from this." So he put so he put it in the movie. He sold it to MGM, and the rest is history. And he goes home with a lot of ASCAP money and an Academy Award. And he had been he'd been nominated three times for Academy Award and didn't win. And finally, he got an Academy Award for this song, which is well, funny. And as I said earlier in the evening, after his Hollywood career, Frank comes to New York, has a very nice size hit with Where's Charlie, but his next musical becomes a true landmark musical based on the Damon Runyon character's Guys and Dolls. 
Uh, the show opens in 1950 at the 46th Street Theater, and it runs and runs and runs. And since that initial production, it's been revived th three times on Broadway. Yes, it has. Uh, and uh, as I said, it was based on Damon Runyon characters. What is it about the Damon Runyon characters, stories that you think appealed to Frank, and why he was so attached to that project, uh, and, and why it was such a success for him? Well, I think that, uh, that both he and Abe Burroughs, who wrote the book, were kind of uh, uh, sort of tough guys, you know. They kind of liked that Damon Runyon, New York broad, they were Broadway guys, you know. Frank would always, would never go and, and buy a tie at a shop. He'd go on Broadway and buy a, a tie from some guy in a corner, you know. They just liked to be kind of tough guys like that, and, and, and I think that that appealed to both of them. They both talked that way, too, by the way, you know, talked like Runyon. <laughs> They'd love to do that. Huh? Yeah, what do you say, Frank? Yeah, Abe, listen, hey, hey, I got an idea. Hey, Abe, you know, <laughs> they love to do that. <laughs> and, and I think that characteristic uh, of how the, the Runyon character spoke and how Abe Burroughs and Frank spoke were clearly trans, uh, translated into the lyrics of the, the characters in the musical. Definitely, they spoke that absolutely. way. Uh, I, I can't believe there's a person here who has not seen Guys and Dolls. So we, so we don't have to talk too much specifically about the show. I will say that the original stars were Sam Levine, Robert Alder, and, and Vivian Blaine. So many of the great songs from Guys and Dolls uh, were, uh, appeared I in the hit parade. And uh, we didn't know which ones to sing for you tonight, so we put two of them together. Joining Ron Raines is a lovely singer who certainly knows a way around a Frank Lesser lyric because she's his daughter. Please welcome Emily Lesser and Ron Raines. What time is it? Oh, I don't know, about 4 a.m. This is your time of day, isn't it? I've never been up this late before. How do you like it? Oh, it's so beautiful and wonderful. You're finding out something I've known for quite a while. My time of day is the dark time, a couple of deals before dawn. When the street belongs to the cop and the janitor with the mop and the grocery clerks are all gone. And the smell of the rain-washed pavement comes up clean and fresh and cold. And the street lamp light fills the gutter with gold. That's my time of day. My time of day. And you're the only doll I've ever wanted to share it with me. Obadiah. Obadiah? What's that? Obadiah Masterson. That's my real name. You're the first person I've ever told it to. I've never been in love before. Now all at once, it's you. It's you forevermore. I've never been in love before. I thought my heart was safe. I thought I knew the score. But this is wine that's all too strange and strong. I'm full of foolish song, and out my song must pour. So please forgive this helpless haze I'm in. I've really never been in love. It's you. 
And you can easily see why that show is revived oh, and revived and loved. Oh, and they sang so beautifully, both of them. God. I had mentioned earlier that uh, How to Succeed was Frank, Lesser, uh, Frank Lesser's last musical to open on Broadway, but it was actually not the last musical he worked on. And I wanted Joe to talk about that musical. It was called Senior Discretion Himself. Tell us a little bit about that piece. Well, uh, that was the last show that he wrote. He started it in 1967. It was from a short story by Bud Schulberg. He had read it in Esquire magazine. And uh, Bud loved uh, Mexico, and it took place in Mexico. And so Frank wrote this Mexican musical, and it was the first one. There's a lot of Spanish and Mexican music going on now, but Frank started in 1967. And he, when he wrote a piece, he would always play music of that where it was. Uh, he wrote a Russian piece that I still have, we haven't done yet, but, but worked, but it didn't work quite well, so that's there. But I heard Russian music forever. I heard Mexican music for three or four days, so I thought I'd go nuts. But uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful piece, and we played it here in Washington. Thanks to Joe, the show actually finally got on, I, I think, at the arena, arena stage. Arena stage, we played there, and we won Best Musical that year. And... Uh, it's a wonderful place to play, by the way. The show never even opened out of town. Did Frank just show the, the show? Uh, he, he became ill, and, and we, had to, we had to drop it for the, for the time being. So, but I'm not dropping it. We're going to do that show. <laughs> it is the last, because it, it has a beautiful score, well, great we, score. It sure does, and we wanted you to hear one of the loveliest songs from that show. It's called You Understand Me. And to sing it, please welcome back Emily and, Les and Joe Lesser. Thank you.
nice song, isn't it? Absolutely. <laughs> Like, like Irving Berlin, Frank Lesser was a good businessman. He understood mm -hmm. it was the music business. Yes. Uh, but unlike uh, Irving Berlin, Frank uh, helped the careers of a lot of great younger songwriters. I know he helped uh, Richard Adlin, Jerry Ross, who would go on to write Pajama Game and Damn Yankees. He worked with Forrest and Wright, uh, who worked on Kismet. Yes. Meredith Wilson, he the music, music man. Music man and produced Music Man. Uh, there's a story that I did not know. Uh, that Joe told me actually backstage a little earlier today. Uh, Frank really had a good heart when it came to many young songwriters, including Sondheim. Uh, tell them the story about what happened uh, after the reviews came out for Sondheim's first musical. For, uh, for a funny thing happened on the way to the forum, uh, the, I don't know, the music did not get good reviews. And Stephen was very, very, very upset. They became good friends and were good friends. Uh, and he was going to quit writing music. He said, I'm not going to write any more music. I'm just going to do lyrics. And Frank heard about that, and he was having none of it. So he wrote him a long letter and delivered it to his townhouse, and it said, Stephen, get up. Get out of there. Get to that piano and write music. You are a superb musician, and you're going to write great music. And Stephen did it, and he always says that Frank is the reason why he kept on writing music which is, was wonderful. I, Frank loved to help young and any kind of composers. He was very generous. His, he, his, uh, his motto was improve the breed. And I think that was wonderful because isn't that nice to do that? Absolutely. He, had a bit, he, just, he just wanted to help all these guys write. I wish somebody would do it today. And something that uh, I know Joe wouldn't say, but after Frank passed away, you continued to run Frank Music, and you yourself signed many great young writers, and, and including a good friend of mine, Craig Carnelia, who I believe oh, was Oh, he last. was a very, very talented young man. Loudon Wainwright, the father of Rufus Wainwright, he had a couple of big hits. He sure did. Yeah. <laughs> well, how could we not have Joe Lester on this stage and not ask her about Most Happy Fellow? Can you tell us a little bit about the rehearsal process, the first time you met Frank? Oh, well, uh, well, I, I met him uh, when I was, the uh, first time I met him was when I was uh, auditioning for Most Happy Fella. And uh, by the way, I don't know if you know it, but the first song he wrote for that show was Joey, Joey, which I think is very interesting. I told that to Ron backstage after he sang it so beautifully, I must say. God, it was gorgeous. Uh, but... Uh, did you, pass, <laughs> did you pass your audition right away? I mean, there must have been stiff competition. Oh, no, I had, I had to audition at least 20 times. Uh, a question I wanted to ask you also about Most Happy Fellow. Uh, the, last, the most recent Broadway revival just had two pianos. Is that something that you think Frank would have appreciated, what he would have approved of? Well, I know that he, that he would have because uh, he always told me that someday he wanted this show to be played in a very small theater, very intimate, and really, really just worry about, you know, the acting. And if they didn't, you know, didn't sing great operatic, that would be okay. So he had a two piano version made, and that's the one that they used when they I played see. that show on Broadway. Well, I thought it was beautiful. I thought it worked. I've seen it at the City Opera. I've seen it in major Broadway productions as well. It works. It works very well, I think, don't it you? It sure does. It has a marvelous score. I think the original cast album was a three-record set, or certainly a two-record It was the first time that they had recorded a complete show. We, we recorded it for Columbia Records, and it took us two weeks. It, was, mm. it took us a long time. <laughs> well, there are countless standards from that show. Those who don't know, besides Joey, 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 Warm All Over, Abadanza, Big D, Standing on the Corner, My Heart is So Full of You, but here's one of Joe's favorites. Welcome back, Susan Egan. Sometimes when you need to describe an iconic composer, it might be best to let another iconic composer do that description. A couple years ago, Up Close and Personal had Jerry Herman here, who I've had the great pleasure of working with, and Jerry just loved Frank Lesser. Let's listen to Jerry speak about him. I think Frank Lesser's music is so distinctive that if you played me a, a couple of songs of his that I didn't know, I think I'd be able to tell you that they were Lesser songs. 
He was a great melodist, but a distinctive melodist. I love a song of his called Somebody Somewhere. Going from major to a, a, a similar phrase, but in minor. And then reaching. Just makes my heart happy. <laughs> to be wanted, needing to be needed, that's what it is, that's what it is, now I'm lucky that somebody somewhere wants me and needs me. That's very wonderful to know Somebody lonely wants me to care Wants me of all people to notice him there Well, I want to be wanted to be needed, and I'll admit I'm all aglow, cause somebody somewhere wants me and needs me, wants only me to smile and say hello. The morning after Guys and Dolls opened, Irving Berlin called Dick Rogers and said, Dick, what are we going to do about the kid? <laughs> well, I guess like Irving Berlin and Richard Rogers and all of us here tonight, what we'll do is to continue to applaud and appreciate and value the legacy of Frank Lesser. Uh, there's no better way to end this evening than with another song from Guys and Dolls. They call you Lady Luck, but there is room for doubt. At times you have a very unladylike way of running out. You're on this date with me, the pickings have been lush. And yet before this evening is over, you might give me the brush. You might forget your manners, you might refuse to stay. And so the best that I can do is pray. Luck be a lady tonight. Luck be a lady tonight. Luck, if you've ever been a lady to begin with, luck be a lady tonight. Luck, let a gentleman see how nice a dame you can be. I know the way you've treated other guys you've been with. Luck be a lady with me. A lady doesn't leave her escort. It isn't fair, it isn't nice. A lady doesn't wander all over the room and blow on some other guy's dice. So let's keep the party polite. Never get out of my sight. Stick with me, baby, I'm the fellow you came in with. Luck be a lady. Luck be a lady. 
luck be a lady tonight Luck let a gentleman see How nice a dame you can be I know the way you've treated other guys you've been with Luck be a lady with me A lady wouldn't flirt with strangers She'd have a heart, she'd have a soul a lady would make little snake eyes at me when I bet my life on this roll. So let's keep the party polite. Never get out of my sight. Stick with me, baby. I'm the fella you came in with. Luck be a lady. Luck be a lady. Luck be a lady tonight. 